Good morning, West Coast, and good afternoon, East Coast. I'm Daniel Sargent, Associate Professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. And I'm excited to be here today in partnership with the Center for Security and Politics and the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity to host and moderate a discussion about the risks and opportunities of emergent technologies with two leading national security experts and lifelong public servants, former Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, and Senator Mark Warner from Virginia. Please allow me to introduce our distinguished guests for today's discussion. Senator Mark Warner was elected as the US Senator from Virginia in November 2008 and reelected to a third term in November 2020. He serves on the Senate Finance, Banking, B Budget and Rules Committees, as well as the Select Committee on Intelligence, where he is the chairman. From 2002 to 2006, he served as governor of Virginia. The first in his family to graduate from college, Mark Warner spent 20 years as a successful technology and business leader in Virginia before entering public office. An early investor in the cellular telephone business, he co-founded the company that became Nextel and invested in hundreds of startup companies that created tens of thousands of jobs. Janet Napolitano is a professor of public policy at the Goldman School and directs the Center for Security and Politics at UC Berkeley. Previously, Janet served as the 20th president of the University of California and formerly as secretary of Homeland Security under President Obama. She is a former two-term governor of Arizona, a former attorney general of Arizona, and a former U.S. attorney for the District of Arizona. Professor Napolitano, I am pleased to turn this conversation over to you. Well, thanks, Professor Sargent, and good afternoon, Senator Warner. It's great to see you. Nice to see you, Madam Secretary. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving, and I know that you all have a very busy schedule uh, over the next few weeks, so we really appreciate you taking this time to uh, be with us and uh, share with us some of uh, your thoughts uh, about new technologies, emergent technologies, cybersecurity, but other uh, issues as well. So let's let's just dive in if, if we can. And uh, uh, what, what do you uh, view as the key emergent technologies that uh, the United States needs to be preparing for? Is it AI, quantum computing, anything else? What are your thoughts there? Well, Janet, one, it's, a, it's great to see you and it's a, it's a great opportunity. I appreciate this opportunity and for Professor Sargent, thank you for the introduction. Um, you know, as you know, but the, the audience doesn't, I was fortunate enough to get involved in kind of an emerging technology back in the, the early 80s. Uh, the beginning is the wireless industry. I just recently, literally just an hour ago, finished a, a Zoom with um, all of my interns and to see the looks on their faces when you know cell phone technology, I said, was a cutting edge emerging technology in the early 80s, early 80s. And they were kind of like baffled by that because it it it, it you know it, it it seems so old old school at this point. So I'm not sure I can fully answer that question of what are the emerging technologies? I know from the intelligence standpoint, um, we look at artificial intelligence, we're looking at quantum computing, we're looking at hypersonics, you know, we're looking at supply chain issues around, uh, around things like semiconductor chips, which are you know, both, both legacy chips and kind of cutting edge next generation. When I think about <clears throat> last week, our committee, um, or two weeks ago, our, our committee had a fascinating brief on what has taken place in both biotech and bioengineering. And there was a great analogy made actually by uh, a professor from, from Stanford and, and um, uh, a startup, not so much startup company in, in life sciences that's done quite well and making the analogy that biotech and bioengineering are the equivalent, where we are now is the equivalent of 1975. And we think back to, you know, um, ones and zeros in 1975. And there was a lot of uh, on, the, on the horizon, not sure we could have fully predicted. So I, I, um, I would put that list out there, but I think we have to include life sciences. I think we have to include um, you know, the, the challenges and opportunities, especially from a national security standpoint of, of overhead uh, satellites and, and what all is, is happening there. And I think we just also have to be on the, on the, 
recognize that no matter what definition we put around emerging today, we have to be nimble enough to amend that so that the next thing that comes out of Berkeley or Stanford or MIT or Virginia Tech, um, you know, that we're flexible enough in our thinking to to um, you know move with where move as technology moves. Yeah, yeah. You you used to uh, have a pretty funny line you used in speeches about Nextel. Uh, do, you, do you want to share that with you? Yeah, well, I would. I would always point out the fact that having involved in in Nextel and, and co-founded it, uh, that I was the only politician that said even when I was speaking leave your cell phone on because if it goes off, others, people hear an annoying sound, I hear cha-ching, cha-ching. And I was thinking about that joke last night and I realized even making that joke today, Janet, would probably not, would, would not go over well with most Generation Z kids because they're saying, well, who uses a cell phone to call somebody on a voice call anyway anymore? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, time goes uh, very quickly, both in, in tech and biotech, uh, which I'm very interested that, that you raised. Mark, what do you think are some of the risks that we already know of associated with new technologies? I, I, I'm reading the, um, um, uh, the new Henry Kissinger and, and um, um, not just Henry Kissinger, it's also uh, Eric Schmidt and, and another on AI at, at this point. And, you know, obviously I think AI poses uh, some of the most dramatic issues as we think about you know, the ability for machines to outperform humans, the ability for machines uh, to um, not only outperform, but take on, you know, take on a decision-making process that may be independent uh, of, of humans. You know, the idea that we would turn, whether it's defense systems or, um, other choices over to uh, machines where there may be algorithmic bias, you know, uh, too often built in by people that look like you and me as opposed to people that look like the rest of the world. Um, how we sort through all that, uh, I'm not sure that we are um, uh, sure of at this point. I do think with like, let's just stay with AI for a moment, if we, look back, I would argue, if we look back now to the late 90s, 1996 Telecom Act, which put in place things like Section 230 and kind of gave the, the total freedom around social media platforms to kind of break things with no impunity or with total impunity. Um, you know, I think there, I would have a more fervent debate. I would come as a policymaker and saying, maybe we should have put at least some initial guardrails in place or have a trigger that says 10 years from now, we're gonna put some guardrails in place uh, because we, we weren't sure, you know, as we think about social media platforms, what both good, but also I would argue just the dark underbelly of, of social media and now putting in place some of those rules and regulations it's been, frankly, one of Congress's greatest failings that we've done nothing, Zippo. Uh, California obviously has moved further ahead on privacy, but on other guardrails, we've not, we've not been able to put any in place to what has become a fairly mature technology. When we think about AI, which makes, makes the issues around you know, social media platforms look puny in comparison, the idea that we're going to allow this kind of set of technologies uh, Big data, machine learning, AI, I mean, the fact that we don't even have full definitions around each of these to evolve on its own kind of in the wild without any guardrails and then think that, you know, 10 years from now, we're going to come back and put guardrails. Um, that worries me. Now, now, if you were to say, all right, what guardrails you put in place, I don't feel I'm competent enough to answer that by any means. So I don't want to, you know, but I, I would hope that we would, I was at, uh, the, when I was in London recently, at, at Google DeepMind, there's some fascinating things going on there. Um, they're moving ahead on a series of areas that, that at least on first blush could benefit humanity. I wish there was an equal set of, of academics, you know, ethical theorists, lawmaker, policymakers, thinking about how we ought to also put some, some guardrails uh, around what's clearly going to be a 
something that's going to fundamentally change all of our lives. And I just worry at times in some of these technologies, when we wake up to the reality of it, um, you know, it, it may be too late. The life sciences issue where the, 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 um, the CEO was talking about the idea around nitrogen, you know, um, uh, the, I believe it was nitrogen around the need for that in terms of fertilizer and how, you know, how much money we spend trying to create these fertilizers, whereby soybeans have the ability to, to do this process literally through the root structure. So the idea that, you know, kind of, I thought with like biotech, they overpromised and underdelivered for years, but literally they're talking about now grafting that kind of uh, uh, biological engineering onto, you know, corn or wheat or other products. And, you know, you could, Obviously, environmentally, it's the right thing. You know, it, it sounds all these wonderful upsides, but um, uh, for every upside, you think in bioengineering, there's also the chances of a dramatic downside. So how we sort this out in a world where, frankly, our policy, make, our policy making in Washington has gotten extraordinarily slower, as you well know. And what I almost feel, uh, and I'm I won't keep going on in this question, but it's an important one. One of the things that has really concerned me uh, over the last few years has been the fact that America, and I would almost argue the West writ large, has retreated from a lot of the standard setting entities that are taking place as these new technologies on an international basis are developed. I, I see this as a former telecom guy on 5G where frankly, we were asleep at the switch and China, and when I say China, my beef is not with the Chinese people, it's with the PRC and Xi Jinping's policies, but they kind of flooded the zone and, and, and um, you know, took over the standard setting entities around 5G. That has, impl you know, has implications well beyond the technology standards. So how do, we, how do we think about each of these emerging technologies in a more holistic way and, and not simply be chasing the technology or chasing the venture capital that's making money out of this technology? Yeah, I think that I think that's uh, right. And so, so I take it you would um, uh, recommend that the administration uh, lead an effort to re-engage internationally with standard setting with these new technologies. I, I think that you, know, you think about when we think about standard setting. The short answer is yes. And when we think about standard setting, it's more than just again as a telecom guy, which frequencies and 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 kind of the basic kind of technology nuts and bolts. I think implicitly we build our biases in. And when those biases are coming from democracies, we build in the notion of some level of, of transparency. We build in the notion uh, that maybe there should not be total governmental control. Uh, we build in the notion that if a, 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 a call is going from you know, Berkeley to Buenos Aires, uh, it maybe shouldn't be routed through, through Shanghai uh, the way Huawei equipment would route, route that. And I do think there is a chance here to kind of re-engage an alliance of the willing amongst, um, uh, amongst uh, democracies around the world. This does not and should not be American only driven. Uh, and I think there is a real willingness um, in, in the inside the administration. I've had a long talk with Secretary Blinken about this recently where they are, you know, they are um, putting in place both kind of an emerging technologies division at, at, at State Department, but also around this standard setting body. Because in the past, what would happen is we would send, you know, both governmental people, but also private industry would come to these, these standard setting bodies. And, and um, you know, generally speaking, kind of the West uh, drove the agenda more. Um, I don't want to focus entirely on Huawei and 5G, but this was a case where, you know, government stepped back, particularly under Trump. And then uh, on top of that, private sector was not sending as many um, uh, experts of these, you know, these associations and entities setting the standards and China flooded the zone. So I, I think this is a, this is one in a variety of areas where I think there could actually be a reemergence of American leadership in combination with our allies. Yeah, uh, Senator, to what extent, uh, does uh, the ability of Congress to be agile and nimble and proactive as opposed to reactive um, uh, re require the um, interaction uh, of, of both parties? Um, and, and 
what is um, what what do you see as some of the issues with the kind of partisanship we see out of DC now? Well, it's it's we would or are these issues, if I might add, are these issues some that uh, members of both parties are are willing to engage in? Well, I, I'll give you the good news and the bad news, and, and obviously, you know, your time as both Homeland Security Secretary and, and as Governor, you know, you governed, you led always in a way that was also that effort of trying to to be bipartisan. And one of the one of the values of bi bipartisan does not mean that the objective solution set is necessarily better, but it does mean that, particularly in our country, when we go from one team controlling power to the other team controlling power, we don't relitigate the issue again. You know, whereas if we do it with only one one team, it's constantly being relitigated, which I don't think makes um, um, makes much sense. Uh, you know, I do think on on technology issues, there's still more agreement. I, I do think one of the great um, frustrations I've had coming as coming from the intelligence committee and kind of being the first to expose some of the manipulation done by the Russians in in uh, using Facebook and other platforms is that we still have not been able to move at all in that area. We've not been able to move in privacy. Again, I point out California has moved in privacy. Obviously, the, the Europeans ha have as well, and we're ceding that traditional leadership. So that would be the bad news. Um, no Section 230 reform, even though Facebook on my daily Politico brief says they are in favor of Section 230 reform. You know, we've not been able to meet some consensus. Yet, um, I I'll point out two areas where I think there, that we are finding agreement. One on the the um, um, the need for America to up its game in the global and domestic production of semiconductor chips, and seeing the shortages there. I mean, the Chips Act, which is part of what's called USICA, uh, a, a broader based research bill, got sixty eight votes in the Senate. It's crazy to me the House has not taken it up, but that that is an area where bipartisan and some big money, fifty two billion dollars on semiconductors and. $2 billion on 5G and ORAN open radio access network. Congress put its mark. I'd also say we have right now the defense bill is up. And one of the amendments we're trying to get on that I think will get 75 votes is around an area that you have a lot of expertise, cybersecurity. You know, as you know, we have no mandatory reporting requirement for cybersecurity incidents. So thank God, you know, SolarWinds reported and Colonial Pipeline reported, but neither of those entities needed to even tell um, CISA, which is the new entity that was, you know, I know you supported that's ultimately been created to try to have that kind of, um, not regulatory, but uh, cybersecurity, domestic cybersecurity expertise, there was no requirement to report. So we've worked to put a reporting requirement with appropriate indemnification and privacy protections and others, because you've got to not only tell the government, the government's got to then share it with other folks in the private sector. And, uh, you know, those are two examples of where there is still bipartisan and on, and I take some more than a little bit of pride in this. I think the intelligence committee, which I'm proud to be chairman of, we kind of view ourselves as the de facto technology committee because there is no committee of technology in, in the Senate, as you know, or in the House for that matter. Um, the House has got a science and technology committee, but it doesn't have as broad a scope as some of the things that I think we're looking at. You know, we we stay bipartisan uh, on, on these issues, some AI to quantum to, you know, concerns about hypersonics. Uh, so there's some good and some bad um, uh, coming out of this, but uh, it is an area where um, in the past, America would have already has exerted its leadership in each of these areas and our failure to do so, I think will, has cost us. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's right. You seek as an interesting um, uh, bill that was uh, uh, pushed uh, by, uh, as you said, bipartisan members of the Senate. I think Senator Schumer uh, played a leadership role there in getting it through the Senate. What all is in USICA besides the CHIPS Act? And I want to return to the CHIPS Act in yeah. a moment. But. USICA has basically $52 billion for CHIPS, $2 billion for 5G and next generation beyond 5G called Open Radio Access Network. Then there is roughly 150 to $200 billion that's not appropriated, so it's simply authorized. 
And a lot of the, the dispute in, in that part uh, has been, it, it is a dramatic plus up of the National Science Foundation. Um, there are other areas, but one of the battles became, should we simply plus up National Science Foundation or should we plus up as well Department of Energy, our, our national labs? So again, you guys in mm -hmm. California are blessed with great ones. We've got at least one in Virginia. And much of the, the I think the unwillingness, we reached some accommodation between NSF and DOE. And frankly, it was not my debate. I'm not sure whether we got the right mark or, or hit the right uh, split there, um, but I think that could be resolved. A, a lot of this um, um, Yusika battle has been, I think, uh, twofold. One, less a partisan battle and more a traditional Senate versus House. The fact that the Senate did all this, you know, and, and Todd Young, Republican Senator, and uh, Chuck Schumer kind of took the lead on one piece of it. John Corn and I on the chips piece took the lead and, you know, the House felt they were left behind. So some of the kind of traditional House versus Senate um, exchanges. And I think there is also, um, you know, an understandably concern that this be viewed not as, uh, be viewed as a pro-America research and development bill and not be viewed as an anti-China bill. And I, again, I think all of these, and I, one of the things I'm very sensitive to, or at least try to be, is recognizing that when we talk about a rise in China, we make clear who our beef is with and that this, you know, some of this anti-China rhetoric does not become used as a tool for anti-Asian American or anti-Chinese American discrimination, which I know we have seen, there's been stories recently that sometimes I think the FBI and others have, have, have um, you know, gone a bit too far. Yeah, so, um, and, and I need to disclose for the audience, I'm on an advisory committee for Intel, which is a semiconductor manufacturer, the largest in, in, uh, in, in the United States and indeed the world. Um, but I think one of the things we've noticed uh, is uh, that semiconductors uh, are pinch points in the supply chain. If you don't have enough semiconductors, you can't produce enough cars, you can't produce uh, enough, ask about any, anything one uses has a semiconductor, a, a chip or chips in it. Um, uh, and uh, I think in this, leads to the issues with China, um, but uh, the bulk of semiconductors are actually manufactured at uh, foundries in Taiwan. Uh, and that raises the issue of uh, China, Taiwan, the United States, are we prepared? Have we thought through this? Uh, what, what are your thoughts there? Well, you know, I, I <clears throat> this is an area you probably have more expertise than I, but I've I've really tried to go to go to school on the industry over the last couple of years. You know, interestingly enough, um, you know, as, as you know, this has been an area that's been boom and bust uh, for some time. And you know, we have two fabs in Virginia, one that's expanding, one that's actually been shut down for a number of years because it went through this boom and bust period. Um, matter of fact. Pre-COVID, uh, there was even some concerns about oversupply in, in the chip industry. And what happened with COVID was, you know, we had this dramatic cutback in capacity, and yet the 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 and, and part of the consumer move towards buying more electronic products they operate at home. That's where the chip manufacturers move their their business and kind of legacy industry like the autos got left behind. One of the reasons why why um you know, we still have some of those auto plant, plants sitting idle. So this, you know, I think we do have to recognize there is kind of boom and bust, number one. Number two, I think we need to have to recognize that, you know, as you know, from Intel, there's, you know, chips is more, not all chips are made the same. There's kind of cutting edge chips, there's legacy chips, there's memory chips. And there are places in this equation, such as packaging and the machining and other areas where, we and our allies, I think some of our allies like uh, in, in the Netherlands and elsewhere, we're still doing pretty well. Um, you point out appropriately though, that, that you know, Taiwan has a lot of some of the most cutting edge manufacturing. 
American manufacturing of overall chip supply has gone from roughly 40% to about 12%. PRC itself has gone from 12 closer to, to, to on the path to 25 to 30. So you have the concerns around national security at Taiwan. You have the kind of increase uh, in, in China itself um, making huge investments, estimates of $150 billion worth of capital investment. Uh, and what you also have are, are countries um, from South Korea that's talking about somewhere between 65 and $130 billion of investment. Uh, you've got Japan talking about multi-billion dollar investments. Taiwan continues to do well. So there is a, there is a question here on a national security basis that we need to have some level of this domestic manufacturing facility in, in our country. There is, I think the, the consensus that I've come to is that unless we provide some additional subsidy dollars, there will not be new fabrication facilities built in America because these fab plants run between eight and $15 billion. And if other nations are willing to subsidize two to $3 billion per fab, and they take a lot of a, a lot of land and a lot of water, and the industry experts say we're about 20% more to 25% more expensive to do it here in America. You know, I think we have to make these investments from a national security standpoint, from maintaining domestic supply chain, from keeping kind of, the, we keep some of the innovation, but I still think having these long-term facilities in, in America make a great deal of sense. And this, this, you know, 20 years ago would be called industrial policy. But when we see other nations, particularly China, um, make these kind of, of huge multi-billion dollar investments, not just in chips, but in a series of other areas. I think we in the United States, and by implication, the West needs to you know, pony up as well. We need to put our money where our mouth is. And, and I found a lot of my Republican colleagues that, you know, and, and I think about you know, John Cornyn or John Thune or, or, or um, um, you know, a number of other uh, senators on, on the Intelligence Committee who, you know, this is a, a pretty dramatic change for them to acknowledge that we, you know, the market alone is not gonna solve this. If we leave this to the market alone, there won't be additional fabrication facilities built in this country. Yeah, we'll, we, we'll lose our domestic production capacity. Yeah. And, and we may then, you know, we may still keep some of the innovation, but, you know, the innovation oftentimes sometimes goes with the fabs too. So I, I think this makes sense. And I think getting it right, um, and this is why USICA or the chip spill is so important, getting it right and having a process that $52 billion, about $12 billion research, $40 billion roughly on that could help subsidize seven to 10 new fabs built over a number of years uh, here in this country. Um, we got to make sure we put appropriate controls in place because I think what we're doing in chips, we may have to do in artificial intelligence. We may have to do, we are already doing in quantum computing. There may be a series of other in our emerging technology areas that we have to make um, these kind of large scale investments in, not just at the research basis, but actually at the development basis as well. Right, so I, I think the, the thought needs to go into what um, are the critical elements of emergent technologies where uh, the United States from a security standpoint uh, needs to put some of its public dollars in to uh, remain competitive with the world. And that's a very different approach to um, uh, spending, uh, government spending than we've seen before, um, uh, where we're actually putting in significant dollars to support one private industry. Yeah, and I, 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 I get this, and matter of fact, I think it was fortunate uh, over, the, over the Thanksgiving break had a, a fairly good critique on, on the chips bill, saying, you know, maybe we're putting it in the wrong place and stuff, and I would push back against some of this. But I think this um, maintaining a, a domestic chip fabrication facilities and its its you know basic research, um, investing in some of these other cutting edge technologies, I would argue is more important than adding an extra plane or ship or tank, because I think most of the comp I think the competition in the twenty first century is going to be around who wins the technology evolutions 
not who builds the most uh, traditional military hardware. Although, again, as you well know, you know, even in the most sophisticated military hardware, you've got to have those bleeding edge chips as an absolutely critical component piece. Oh, for sure. And um, so, so they, uh, it's, you can't easily segregate between uh, uh, hardware that you need um, on the military side versus uh, what we need uh, simply for supply, uh, domestic production of consumer goods and other, other material. Well, one of the things, let me just add one thing here, um, Jennifer, you know, one of the reasons why I think there's been part of this evolution is that um, I think COVID showed, you know, that the just-in-time global supply chain model that we've all kind of gotten really used to along yeah. with and gotten used to, that at the end of the day, um, that you know it may be worth a, 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 an extra few cents on a uh, on a chip or a, a, you know an extra two cents on some PPE to make sure that there is a domestic or if not entirely domestic domestic plus allied supply chain because um, uh, again the, the my friend Debbie Stabenow who argued very strongly with me and one part of the battle, make sure at least some of this went into legacy chips, which I was not 100% sure of at the beginning, you know, the number of auto plants that are sitting idle in Michigan right now because they don't have access to chips, um, you know, all the tanks in the world aren't gonna stop that. Yep, yep, uh, that, that, that is for sure. Um, uh, and and uh, turning to you, Sika, Mark, um, uh, what do you hear on the house side? Is it is it going to be stuck there forever? Is it going to move? I, I think it's. I think there is a recognition. There was an announcement um, right before Thanksgiving that uh, that we would have a conference on uh, this bill. I'm not sure what the house is going to. What's the house bill? There was some minor bills that were kind of in this neighborhood, but nothing of this scale. Um, so it is in my mind one of the highest priorities that we that we need to make happen. Um, I, I, I think Secretary Maramondo, uh, Commerce Secretary, has been great from the administration at pushing this and advocating for it. I wish the, the White House had been as active on pushing for this. Again, this was a case that of a bill that was passed in July. Uh, and, and putting on my partisan hat for a moment, you know, um, uh, you know, coming out of some of the challenges around Afghanistan, if we sent a strong signal of, you know, passing USICA, that we were stepping up our game, not only on chips, but on investment in emerging technology, I think that would have been a great win for the president and, and a great signal to the rest of the world. Um, and it's been more than a bit frustrating that, uh, that other than this kind of, you know, inner scene, who gets credit house versus Senate, uh, there's not been a lot of clarity. So I'm, I'm hoping to be on that conference committee and uh, ready and anxious to meet to get to yes, uh, uh, the sooner the better. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, agreed. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about cybersecurity, but let's, let's turn to that directly if we could. Um, uh, when I started as secretary in 2009, uh, our chief threat stream still involved aviation security. And I spent maybe 10% of my time on cyber. By the time I left four and a half years later, I was spending a good 40 to 50% of my time on cyber. I mean, it was, an ex it was exploding. Um, uh, um, given uh, our hope that we don't end up in an actual kinetic war with uh, China, but we, we uh, can anticipate that we're in a, a, a battle in a way in the so-called gray zone um, uh, where cyber is concerned. Um, and, you know, how do you see uh, our interactions with the Chinese in this area, but the Russians, the Iranians, others that um, are active uh, in, in the cybersecurity realm? Well, I, I think, you know, Secretary Mayorkas, now the current Homeland Security Secretary, if he's not spending 
60 or 70 percent of his time. And with CISA, which again, I know uh, was, uh, was the independent agency that's been set up afterwards, took us too long, not due to you by any means, but, but you know, it took us too long to get it stood up um, to try to have that <clears throat> domestic non-regulatory, but, you know, the, the, the fire person you call, you know, when the fire gets lit, call CISA so they can help you public privately respond. Um, huge, huge issue. I mean, China, uh, you know, during your tenure with tenure with, with President Obama, I think you did send a strong signal to China for a while, and they cut back on some of the intellectual property theft. But it is estimated that you know China steals three hundred to five hundred billion dollars a year of IP from us and around the world. That's a lot of dollars that if you don't have to invest as a nation state, then you can acquire you can, you can steal that through cyber, um, or it's not just entirely cyber through joint ventures and other things. And let me also say, I think a lot of American and other businesses have turned a blind eye to the Chinese government's bad behavior because of their you know, fear that they would lose the Chinese market and consequently have made compromises they wouldn't make anywhere else. But that intellectual property theft is where China has done most of its activity. Russia has done you know, traditional information exploitation the way solar winds, but also uh, you know, they are, Russia and its quasi agents of people that may work for the GRU during the day and cyber criminals at night, they have been much more um, ransomware based uh, attacks. But I've, I, I like to step back and say for a minute, you know, solar winds were the bad guys, the Russians in this case, been, been attributed, you know, um, got into 18,000 companies. Luckily, they just exfiltrated information. But if that had been a complete denial of service and shutdown of those 18,000 companies, our whole economy could have come crashing to a halt. So this is an area where we are still vulnerable. And there was a, a fascinating story, again, I saw in, in you know, the public press over the last three or four days that has shown <clears throat> kind of the next, where this kind of cyber um, activity, still not kinetic, but uh, conflict may be headed. And that is the case, and I've not gotten independent intel on this. This is just from you know public domain, domain stories that showed the recent back and forth between Iran and Israel, where mm -hmm. the Iranians thought that the Israelis were shutting down their all their gas stations and drove up the cost of their gasoline and through complete disruption for a couple of weeks into people's availability to get gasoline in Iran. And the Israelis have then said, you know, the Iranians broke into the uh, um, you know, the biggest you know, gay website in Israel and disclosed a million and a half Israelis' private information. So this is where this is different than a ransomware attack, or this is different than stealing intellectual property, or this is different than traditional spying. But this may be the kind of where cyber conflict is headed, you know, where you've got again, you're not bombing someone, you're not. Um, you, 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 you may not be uh, you know, violating the rules of war, but you are definitely affecting a domestic population's lifestyle. So I think this is, you know, if you, uh, whether it's one, two, or three, if you say, what are, as, as chairman of the Intelligence Committee, what keeps me up as much at night, cyber is definitely one of the top three. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm glad to hear that. Um, but I'm not glad to hear that because we wish it, it it weren't such a present risk, but it, it, it certainly is. Um, you know, one of the uh, areas of risk associated with new technologies is the, is the risks to our democracy itself um, and uh, the role of social media in uh, um, being sort of an accelerant on the flame of extremism uh, on both sides, but primarily in the U.S. recently, we've seen it uh, on the on the right wing side. Um, what what do you think uh, Congress can do or should think about that? We ought to do some version of what California and the Europeans have done with GDPR and put in place some basic privacy rules. Number one, number two. Um, and, and these go before the potential of breakup, which I've not moved to yet, but, but 
but I'm you know, open to if we don't if we don't make some progress. I think what we ought to do, and I was a telecom guy as I mentioned earlier, we ought to import some of the ideas from telecom. There used to be really hard to move from one telephone company to another in terms of long distance, so you had number portability. I think we need data portability and interoperability. So if you get tired of a certain platform, you can easily migrate with all your data to Nuco and still then talk or communicate with people that, that remain on the, on the, the previous platform. Uh, so data portability. I think, and this is something, again, I know uh, the California legislature looked at, uh, but wasn't able to get across the line. And this may probably would be too, too much for the American Congress to, to grapple with. But I think you know, the idea that Facebook and Google and Twitter and so forth are free you, know, you and I both know they're not free. Their, their model is simply based on they suck information out from us and then monetize that. I, I think there's nothing implicitly wrong or morally wrong necessarily with that, but I think we ought to become informed consumers. So I'm a big believer that there ought to be some requirement that these platform companies share with their consumers or their, their products, as the case may be, you know, how much that data that they're sucking out of us is actually worth. So some level of uh, data viability law. Um, a visibility law. And then I finally think we, we do need to take on um, what I referenced earlier, Section 230, which back in the late, uh, late 90s, when this legislation was passed, basically put in place a, com a complete impunity and a complete legal liability shield against any of the content on these platforms. Um, you know, maybe that was right in the late 90s. I'm not sure 25 years later, it still makes sense. And again, even the large com platform companies like Facebook say they're willing to do changes there. And we have made certain changes. I mean, you, you, childhood pornography, you, you know, bomb making. Um, I've got legislation with Amy Klobuchar and Maisie Hirono that would uh, call the Safe Tech Act that would say, let's, let's at least make certain things that are already illegal illegal if they're if they are used by social media companies so if you're doing civil rights violation in business and you're doing that over social media there ought to be some liability if you have uh, the, the illegal tort illegal alien act which is um basically you know what facebook allowed when when the miramar government was using uh facebook as a platform to encourage people to go out and murder the rohingya you know, there should be some liability there. If you are levels of cyber bullying that are illegal in certain other areas, maybe they should be illegal as well on, 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 uh, on social media. The ability to be able to enforce injunctive relief. I mean, there was this you know, horrible case of uh, somebody on, on, I think the grinder site that got, you know, somebody manipulated, somebody said he was another person, had his life basically ruined um, and there was no ability, even though there was uh, the, to get injunctive relief to try to prevent what the platform didn't even deny was happening, but they said Section 230 pro uh, protects us. And then also, I do think um, there ought to not be, uh, well, I think their First Amendment obviously needs to be preserved, and you do have a right to say stupid stuff. Whether you have the right to have it amplified a billion times remains to be seen, but I don't think there should be that same kind of First Amendment protection if a platform is is uh, receiving you know benefits from paid advertising i mean there are prohibitions on on television and, and radio from and other mediums if you are selling a a faulty product or a, a pyramid scam that's that's um, you can go, been gone after there is no such prohibition uh, on social media so this our Safe Tech Act, I think, preserves the First Amendment, but gets set at some of a, 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 it's not full content moderation, but it simply does enforce um, uh, some of the laws that are already out there now on social media. There's also been, and we're still looking, we've had some good conversations with Republicans to get uh, bipartisan support. There is a companion bill already in the House. There's been another approach that has been, gotten some bipartisan approach uh, bipartisan support that I've been also looking at that looks at the, again, easy to say, hard to put in place, you know, the algorithmic biases that may be coming in place. If the algorithm is sending you disproportionately to some place that is, is uh, you know, uh, that, and I, I don't fully understand 
how they're how they're shaving this because it's easy to say, but if it sends you to an illegal site, by definition, that is a little harder to sort through. Um, but I think there is, you know, even this week, it's been suggested that the House Energy and Commerce Committee, where probably this will more arise, is going to have a meeting on on this whole universe around Section 230. That I, I hope would move. I've gone on way too long on this answer. I wish we could have moved some of these other areas like data portability, data valuations, and I've got bipartisan legislation on what's called dark patterns, in which, again, I think you know, and this audience probably knows, but for those who don't, you know, it's when a, when something comes up uh, on, on the site that you have no basic ability to opt out. You, you get the big flashing light here to sign up here, and you've got to go three different pages to find a place to say, no, I don't want this. So uh, that's been, you know, that's technically called a dark pattern usage, and that ought to be prohibited as well. Right. So um, what, you're, what you're saying is that there ought to be uh, uh, some guardrails, I'll use that word, on uh, going to the business model that the platforms use. Um, as opposed to government necessarily itself regulating the content. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get to, you know, because of the First Amendment and because I don't think in a, any bipartisan way you can get to um, content uh, regulation. And I also don't know if I want to. Um, I don't think, you know, I disagree with some of my friends on the right who say these social media companies have an implicit anti-conservative bias. I think it's actually their bias the is to way. make money. Their bias is to make money. And if you look at who the top 10 um, you know, the posters on, on Facebook on a daily basis, you know, most of your audience has not heard of probably seven of them because they are far right wing, uh, you know, uh, bloggers and posters. Um, so I, yes, so the thing is, I think we do have to obviously respect our First Amendment. I think there are ways to respect that First Amendment. Uh, but still put some um, appropriate guardrails in place. You know, although, and one last comment, because I've been following this abroad as well, I know this is a hard subject to grapple with because even when you look at content moderation in countries that don't have a First Amendment, you know, after the great tragedy in, in New Zealand at the mosque shooting and some of the activities in France, um, you know, uh, the Bernie Abel uh, shootings and the manipulation of social media in the UK and elsewhere, none of these other countries or kind of the Western democracy countries at least, have totally sorted this out. I actually think the British uh, are going to come up with uh, some legislation that they think will uh, get fully vetted early next year. They may be one of the first, but this is a, you know, even a country with countries that are not, that don't have First Amendment productions, this is not an easy needle to thread. It's, and that's one of the reasons why I think the idea that, that there's so much attraction and why I've not ruled this out. If we can't put some, some guardrails in place, or if we can't add some more pro-competition notions like data portability uh, and, and data valuation, then you know, some of my colleagues have said, we need to look at full breakup. Um, you know, I'm not taking that off the table. Okay, uh, good, good to hear. So 2.30 is still uh, an active topic of conversation with your colleagues. It, it is, it, and, it's, and it's how we can be in a, in a situation after the, um, uh, the whistleblower from Facebook testified, you know, what was it, a month or two ago, mm -hmm. with absolutely damning comments about how that platform uh, is, is uh, um, you know, in her case, I think the most powerful was manipulating young women uh, uh, around eating disorders and other issues uh, and, and say that that status quo is acceptable is just beyond me. Yeah. Yeah, uh, to, to, totally uh, agree. Um, you, you've mentioned several times uh, uh, working uh, with the other side of the aisle, and you were one of the lead negotiators on the so-called Bipartisan Infrastructure Act that the president recently signed. Um, uh, how did you get that done? Uh, and you know I'm going to ask about the reconciliation bill, but first of all, how did you get the bike? Right, give me the, bill give me the nice one first. Give me the nice one first. Um, yeah, here's the here's the slow here, pitch over the center. Part of, of it was, you know, what was, and I don't. Um, the mainstream media's attention span is 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 pretty short, uh, which is not exactly a newsflash, 
But, you know, people are saying, how did this group come together? Well, most of this group, at least eight of the 10 of us, had worked very closely together with then Secretary Mnuchin on the last uh, COVID relief bill that took place in, in December of, of 2020, the so-called 908 bill. It had nine or eight billion dollars of relief. So we had, you know, many of these my Republican friends like Susan Collins and and you know Lisa Murkowski and and Bill Cassidy and Mitt Romney uh, and, and Rob Portman. You know, we'd worked with in the past. So this group kind of came about with Rob Portman and Kirsten Sinema, who were not in the 908 group working. We had a prior working existing relationship. And so there was trust. Um, and it was it was still hard sausage making. You know, it took a long, long time to get there. And, you know, the fact that we got 19 Republicans and kudos to my Republican colleagues who took enormous amounts of grief uh, for working with us. But, you know, it's kind of hard to deny that a, a nation like ours that hadn't made a meaningful investment in infrastructure in 50 years, that that wasn't good policy and not just roads and bridges, but things like resiliency, things like, you know, broadband deployment, $65 billion, things like, frankly, even the energy component, a lot of transition to smarter grid, to investment in electric vehicle infrastructure, electric buses. Um, you know, it was, a, I think, a, a, a good piece of work. And it, again, it was not, I'm not putting on, again, my partisan hat for a second. I thought it was completely stupid that, you know, Democrats in the House, would not go ahead and once we pass that in middle of July, go ahead and pass it then to give the president a big win and the country a big win. Yeah. Um, and, and there was certain irony that we, you know, it, it, it literally got signed about a week after our election in Virginia and wearing my partisan hat again, where we lost uh, the governorship and at least you lost, partially. You lost the, the whole ballot, right? All yeah, we lost the, the whole ballot. ballot and partially due to the fact that we, you know, we had this big win that we could have gone and talked to people in Virginia about and said, you know, and the gubernatorial candidate could have said, listen, I'm, you know, I know what we can do here about this road, or I know what we can do here about this broadband. Um, uh, that would have been a tangible item. So um, um, it was, you know, I, I'm proud of the work. I think it will, it will be, um, you know, significant for our country in a host of areas. I do think one of the things, and you as a, as a, Governor will get this more than most of my colleagues. You know, we all know the, that was governors that passing the bill is just the first step, how it gets implemented. And this level of new spending in areas where you're either creating new programs entirely or pumping up uh, historic numbers, things like roads and bridges, you know, it, it, we need the best oversight team possible. And I think the president's taken a good step with my, our, our mutual friend, Mitch Landrieu, but I think there ought to be a whole team of people on implementation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so turning to the next bill, the reconciliation uh, bill, which um, is uh, now in, in your chamber in the Senate, uh, again, kind of give me how you see the lay of the land there. Well, I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic. Um, you know, I'm not going to put a date certain on it, uh, but you know, at roughly 1.75 billion. And I was prepared to do more than that, you know, because I think again, over a 10 year frame, um, you know, the inflationary pressures we're feeling right now, partially due to supply chain, but if they're doing the government spending, it's because of the $5 billion, $5 trillion that we spent under both Trump and, and Biden on COVID relief. Um, but I think, you know, if we talk about what's in it, that are pro-growth, like you know, we know we need more people back in the workforce, disproportionately women. Well, childcare and and guaranteed preschool are two pretty good places. You know, making sure that uh, the piece this morning that I saw on the news that one out of every five Americans is a caregiver, in one level or another, whether it's for kids or for aging parents, providing some support, particularly for you know aging parents and disabled. I think that makes a lot of sense. Taking on climate change. Uh, in a meaningful way. I would do a carbon tax, but, you know, even without that, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of incentives. And, you know, I say this is, as you know, father of one of my daughters, is a type one diabetic, at least trying to bring down or put a cap on, on a, a drug like insulin costs, um, you know, it makes some sense to me. I think we've spent, you know, and it's easy, you know, I guess I've been partially guilty of this as well. We've spent the last four months talking about top line numbers and 
Most of the Americans don't have the foggiest idea what's in this legislation. Component parts are, are popular. So I'm trying to talk about what's in it. I would have, you know, if I could have even corrected a little bit more, I would have probably tried to do less for a longer period of time than, you know, the, the whole wish list. Uh, because again, I think you and I both know um, from our time as governor and you being more in the belly of the beast of the federal government to even than me, you know, having the, the record of the federal government under any president to implement a whole lot of new programs simultaneously has been mixed to say the best. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, one always worries when you see a program that, that is only funded for a year or two years, um, uh, given how the political lay of the land can be changing, et cetera, et cetera, regardless of the merits of the program. So neither party has much, neither party has clean hands on creating fiscal cliffs, whether it's on tax cuts that expire too early or expire at some point or starting new programs. And I think, again, I, if I could wave a partial magic wand, I would have, uh, um, I would have made it less programs. The only other thing I'd just say on this second half is, um, uh, and I'm not sure we can shift the battleship again. You know, a lot of the initiatives, well, you know, extraordinarily important to climate change. Um, a lot of the other kind of social initiatives in this plan feel like they were, the, the list was put together pre-COVID. And if there was a major change I would make in this legislation, it would be, you know, thinking through the ideas of you know, the fact that I think many Americans are post COVID rethinking what they want to, what their work life balance ought to be and how we invest in human capital and treat that investment from a tax accounting and reporting system, at least as well as we treat things like research and development and tangible goods would be a, um, would have been the area that I wish we would have spent some more time on. So let me just ask one concluding uh, question. If you could step back a moment, um, uh, the, the United States um, has been the world's leading economy because we have led in technology and innovation uh, for years. And our universities have been talent magnets from around the world, actually. Um, what do you think the United States needs to do and what Congress needs to do to, to sustain that position? as the number one kind of innovation center for the globe? Well, um, I think we've seen, let me step back and say, I think we've seen that without American leadership, candidly, the rest of the world flounders a little bit. And we saw that when President Trump so dramatically tried to take, you know, basically take America out of that leadership role. And I think, you know, waiting for the Europeans or the Japanese or any of the other countries to kind of take on these macro risks on their own without American leadership. Uh, you know, I think the world suffered. I think democracy suffered over the, the last four years. But to get this right, we need to make these kind of investments like USICA, but we also need to make sure that we continue to be a, a attraction of top talent from around the world. Immigration reform, um, you know, making sure that our challenges, for example, with, with China are, are focused on the challenge of the Communist Party and not turn this into an anti-Asian or anti-Chinese, you know, uh, kind of uh, political propaganda. I think there are countries like Australia that seem to have even managed particularly that component of how you deal with the Chinese diaspora better than America. I think there's things we can learn there. So let's keep investing in our, our universities. Let's go ahead and realize we are going to have to get into at least the area of quasi-industrial policy to stay competitive with China in many of these areas. And let's make sure we continue to be the, the, the place where the best talent from around the world want to live and then study and, and uh, live their lives. There you go. Well, th thank you so much, Senator. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. Uh, I know we have some questions coming in from uh, the audience. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Sargent. Terrific. And I'm going to seize the opportunity to lead off with a question of my own, uh, if, if you don't mind. Um, earlier in your conversation, uh, I think, Senator Warner, uh, you reflected uh, that you wish there was a set of academics, uh, theorists, uh, sort of policymakers, thinking about how to manage the consequences of artificial intelligence uh, for uh, security, for, for society. 
And in response to that observation, I would like to ask you both uh, to reflect upon the role that universities can play in managing threats emanating from emerging technologies. Now, I'm mindful as a historian of the role that the service academies historically have played anticipating and responding to disruptive technological change from the advent of battleships to the rise of air power. Do you think that civilian universities, which are after all key generators of technological disruption, could be more proactive in anticipating uh, security risks, uh, social risks that emanate from disruptive technologies and in participating in the development of solutions? Janet, you wanna go first? You want me to go first? You go first. All right, well, let, let, let me just, one, it's a great question and obviously uh, to a, a world of, of mostly academic audience, I'm gonna say yes, <laughs> but, uh, but with a, a couple of caveats. One, um, there's an interesting idea that Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and Senator Ben Sass have, um, that I'm very intrigued with. I wanna see it fleshed out a little more about creating in a sense, the equivalent of a cybersecurity academy um, that would be, you know, maybe not guaranteeing military service, but recognizing again that that this is going to be an ongoing threat. But you know, how you train people and how we kind of move people in and out of government around cybersecurity, and it, this also begs the question of 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 a kind of a nerdy issue, but security clearance reform, so you can get people in and out of government reform on an easy basis. On the issue of of AI and the others, I absolutely think. The academic community is is critically important. I I do think though, it needs to be married in some in some format so that it gets the recognition that it deserves. I am sure that on at Berkeley and the, you know there's probably fifty different around the country, not just Berkeley, fifty different you know academics or even working groups that are looking at AI and its implications for ethics and policy and. But how that information filters to policymakers and how it's done in a collaboration with the, the very investors who are making these decisions, the, the, the private capital, and um, some folks in the government, that's where I think we could still make some improvement. But the basic premise is absolutely dead on. Well, I have to agree with my, my <laughs> friend, the distinguished senator from Virginia. Um, uh, and I, and I uh, I think what we need to develop is a better bridge between the academy and uh, the policymaking world and the political world, quite frankly. Um, uh, and, and I think if we can do that, one of the advantages to the political and policymaking world is to have um, uh, access to <clears throat> Uh, those in the academy who are thinking not just of today's technology, but who can see around the corner and see what's in development, what, what's the next thing, so that we can become, as a country, more nimble, agile, and proactive. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think perhaps, for example, on AI, where we know there are technical, legal, ethical, moral questions around AI, uh, the idea of forming some sort of an independent commission with kind of one goal, you know, in, you know, four months, give us your best recommendations on how we handle AI. I, I, and I, and I think um, academicians would leap at that opportunity. And, and I would sim simply add to the, the secretary's comment that you, we did have Eric Schmidt and Bob Wolf did a pretty good paper on AI that was some of this multidisciplinary but it needs to be ongoing. And I would just to be, so it doesn't sound like I'm being a total, um, uh, you know, uh, playing to the audience here. Uh, I, would, I would say, I would challenge um, the academic world that I, I feel, and I see this you know, in my own state with our institutions, that because the sausage making has gotten so ugly mm -hmm. and because in certain areas we've looked so inept, and then you've had, you know, the, the antithesis of the, the epitome of kind of anti-science uh, academic leadership under the former president. Um, I think there's been a lot of the ac academia, academia that's kind of basically said, you know, we're not going to mess with policymakers and politics. And I think that is a, is a horribly wrong decision and, and um, you know, both the kind of intellectual rigor that we need in debates and the ideas in this, Janet said, the ability of people who can see around the corner a little bit, we need you more than ever. 
and it's going to be messy. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that Eric Schmidt and all have, have spoken about is the need to have a technology sophisticated workforce in the government. Uh, and that's one of the things we've been trying to think through at Berkeley, like how do we support that development of that kind of a, a pipeline? Um, and, I, and I think it, by in the government, I mean both in the, in the interagency, in the federal executive agencies, but also in the staff for the, for the Senate and the House, because as you know, uh, so much of the prep work gets done by staff. Yeah, and that's again where I think the kind of nitty gritty issue, and I've been working on this a lot, and we even made some progress under Trump, getting security clearance reform done mm -hmm. so that people can move in and out from academia into the government, and for that matter, back into the private sector. You know, I, I see on a regular basis, um, you, know, you know, good staff. I'm sitting with one right here who got stolen away by industry or gets stolen away by ac academia because, you know, because it's a, uh, you know, the sausage making process, at least recently, has been pretty damn messy. Yeah. Um, you got to have this ability to come back and forth. For sure. For sure. So, so let me pick up in response uh, sort of this metaphor of bridge building, uh, which you've both deployed, I think, to describe the relationship between academia and, and government. And I would be you know, really interested uh, to, to hear you reflect upon uh, whether um, academics might be more sort of proactive in getting engaged with Congress uh, as distinct from, from the executive agencies. You know, often officials in the executive agencies are, you know, really, you know, fixated with operational, tactical sort of day-to-day -day problems. Is Congress a venue in which, uh, you know, academics might be more uh, sort of constructively engaged with sort of longer term, uh, more strategic level uh, challenges? Um, I, I, I'll start again. Since I'm here, you know, the short answer again is yes. And, and I think about, um, you know, the intelligence committee, we have a technical advisory groups that we have, where we put academics. And, you know, I, I, I've been now chair for only about 10 or 11 months, um, but we need to use those more often. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of, when the, the Congress are, goes from, radically one end to the other back and forth, having that continuity because building these relationships, particularly with academics, into the congressional sausage making process, you know, I don't think any academic is going to come and, and feel fully utilized on a short term basis. It has to be some level of trusted relation. It goes again to mm -hmm. what Secretary Napolitano said is we got to do this just not at the member level, but you got to have that trusted staff people that can again continue to build those relationships. But I think this is that's an area that that we have um, um, underutilized. And, you know, for that matter, we've even underutilized outside of academia. You know, as, as Janet knows, there's a whole total other industry in Washington of very smart people that are in the think tanks, and at least on the Democratic side, our ability to use the even the brains that are 15 minutes down the road um, has been pretty pretty poor over the last few years. Yeah, and I think, uh, Daniel, one of the um, uh, challenges is be because Congress is involved in sausage making, um, and um, it, it's a big place, you got 535 members, you've got all the staff, et cetera, it's knowing how to plug in and where to plug in. Um, and, uh, you know, working out so some sort of process uh, uh, by which, um, uh, Congress knows where to go, and in the reverse, those in academia know where to go. Uh, an audience member asks, artificial intelligence is a fast emerging technology that straddles industries from national defense to healthcare. When will Congress propose definitive federal legislation to create a regulatory body or even a new department to manage this, this new technology? It's a big question, uh, but the topic is so important that it you know, seems, seems worth pondering. My read is that uh, there will need to be some sort of crisis regarding AI before Congress um, actually acts. Um, but I do think there will be a need for some sort of regulatory approach uh, to AI. And I, and I think we actually would be benefited if we had it, um, if it was beginning now. But I, I think Congress moves when there's a crisis. 
and I, I would agree. And I think, you know, that's kind of where we started the conversation. I am, you know, rather than trying to fix this or put guardrails after the quote unquote AI industry is fully stood up, um, uh, would be a mistake. So how can we get ahead of it? Or at least how can we uh, enhance some regulatory entity that would be at least looking at it? But we don't even have a good definition uh, you know, at this point. And, and you know, somebody who's spent a bunch of time, um, I could sort through a little bit of the differences between you know, big data, machine learning, AI, where one begins and the other ends. You know, I've read Kai-Fu Lee's book about the, the challenge of you know, the China-US competition around AI, fascinating. Um, uh, but I'm not sure most policymakers, we need, you know, we need academia combined with, with um, you know, the emerging AI industry to help us at least get the definitions right. Um, so we can you know, figure out where that regulatory or at least advisory group ought to be. Right, and I, and I think, although I, I, I recommend that uh, we grab hold of AI now, um, you know, there are risks uh, involved, um, incorrect technological assumptions, uh, too much technological specificity, uh, uh, omissions, unintended consequences, all of those go into uh, uh, developing a regulatory approach uh, to a new technology. But we have to recognize those risks. And I think the benefit, nonetheless, of grabbing hold now uh, outweighs those, those kinds of risks. Yeah, l l let me improvise a follow-up question uh, sort of to, to that terrific audience question, uh, which is to sort of ask you uh, to, to ponder whether you think uh, some degree of sort of international cooperation is going to be necessary to deal uh, with threats uh, sort of emanating from this really broad uh, sort of world of, of artificial intelligence. If we think specifically uh, about, uh, say, the battlefield use of, of artificial intelligence, there might be precedents in the Geneva Conventions for uh, sort of international uh, you know, treaty uh, rules uh, to limit uh, the deployment of, of AI on the battlefield. But achieving such progress really requires sort of international cooperation. Do you think there's a, a realistic prospect of you know, governments coming together uh, to tame the disruptive effects of, of AI as a military technology? You know, I, I think that's a big question. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look historically as somebody who's advocated that we ought to have some international norms around cybersecurity, you know, uh, so that uh, you, know, you might have a lower attribution requirement if you're raiding a hospital system, you know, or if you're breaking in or creating a ransomware to strike back, um, uh, you know, and, but my at least understanding is it was actually in the United States when the rest of the world, including the Soviets and the Chinese and others in the late nineties, the Russians, I guess, in the late nineties, were talking at, at the UN about an international standards around cybersecurity. It was actually America that was reluctant because we felt we were so far ahead that we didn't want to enter into any kind of international international norm, normative uh, uh, entity, number one. Number two, I do think we needed this internationally because I uh, can keep coming back to the CCP. I think we've, we've seen, you know, if China, which the Chinese Communist Party has access to not only all the government data, but to the access to, to uh, the Badu data, the WeChat data, the Alibaba data, and they have already created an Orwellian surveillance state uh, with social credit scores, if that model of AI, you know, becomes the dominant one, um, I, I think we should all be extraordinarily concerned. So again, this goes back to the point I've tried to make, and I think the administration gets it, but they need to put some real emphasis behind this, that there needs to be this coalition of the willing. And, you know, it ought to not just be the five eyes or NATO, but it ought to include, you know, South Korea and Japan and Australia and Taiwan and Singapore and India, Israel, there ought to be this coalition of the willing around, um, uh, particularly, as you said, uh, Daniel, AI. Um, I totally uh, agree. And um, I, I think that we, we should work to establish that kind of coalition of the willing, uh, regardless of the CCP. Um, uh, if we wait to see if the CCP will come to the table, 
it, it won't happen. So, um, but there are many nations around the world, I think, who would be in a coalition of the willing and, and kind of amassing that and creating that critical mass would be a good, a good, good thing. And then, let me just add one thing on there. And I think that may mean, and you know, this will be part of my responsibility and others in government, that just because we may have a short-term advantage in some subsets of AI, doesn't mean that we should walk away from that international order um, because the value of us doing this collaboration in the long run, you know, whatever short-term leads we have now, I mean, I argue the same thing, you know, the, ra the race on quantum, you know, who gets to quantum first can break through, you know, all defenses in the cyber world. But it's, it's um, um, I, I think we ha need to think about this in concert with, uh, with others. Yeah, I mean, the history of the uh, nuclear uh, weapons uh, technologies provides sort of powerful corroboration for that point. But l let me um, sort of segue uh, to an audience question about uh, China's uh, authoritarian abuse of artificial intelligence technologies. An audience member is curious to know, what lessons can we learn from China's domestic application of AI and of machine learning to abuse human rights in Xinjiang? where extensive and highly advanced surveillance systems monitor and automate aspects of forced labor camps. As we think about the problem of how to regulate AI and machine learning uh, sort of domestically in the United States, I think what the question is asking us to contemplate is, should we see China as a sort of cautionary example? And if so, what do we do about it? Well, I, 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 you know, using China as a cautionary example, I think, uh, you know, that establishes uh, the need uh, for the United States and a coalition of the willing to uh, take on these um, AI related issues um, because uh, I think the countries that would be in such a coalition uh, don't wanna see the Chinese model, the CCP model as the template. Yeah. And I would simply add on that, that you know, it's, it's not just in Xinjiang, you think about, you know, think about what's happened to the people of Hong Kong, uh, you know, mm -hmm. where you had one estimate, 80% of the people take place in some level of protest over, mm -hmm. and, you know, you've heard barely a peep and from businesses, you know, that I know that are in Hong Kong, they feel like they now have to play by exactly the same rules if they were in Shanghai, Beijing, because this massive ability to not only use governmental data, but the access. I mean, the fact that when the CCP changed the laws in China and explicitly said in 2016 that every private, every company, first obligation is not to their shareholders, but to the CCP, that means all that data um, uh, goes. And it, it ought to be a forewarning um, uh, to, to, again, this coalition of the willing that we need to get our act together. Agreed. So we focus mostly in this conversation on the security threats uh, resulting from emerging technologies, but I wonder if we might sort of take the last uh, sort of five minutes to reflect upon uh, the disruptive effects for society writ large, as several audience questions are inviting us uh, to do. Um, so one question uh, that, that an audience member has, has posed is how do we begin to grapple uh, with the consequences of artificial intelligence for sort of distributive equity uh, in, in society. AI technologies right, are poised uh, to create uh, sort of new forms of inequality, perhaps greater than any that we've had to grapple with in the past. Is dealing uh, with the uh, social consequences, the economic consequences of technological innovation sort of within uh, sort of the purview of lawmakers or, or is this a problem that is simply sort of, you know, too big to address? I will, I'll, I'll start on that one. That was, a, that's, and, and, and let me analogize, um, Secretary Napolitano tried to do this as well when I was governor, when she was governor, and she may have been luckier than me, but I always thought that we look back 25 years, you know, to the kind of promises of an interconnected world. Um, you know, the promise of an interconnected world was going to be, you could build it anywhere. And that should have been potentially hugely empowering to rural America, you know? But we ended up showing those, we could build it in Beijing and Shanghai and Mumbai, but we didn't do a very good job of Martinsville, Virginia or Roanoke, Virginia or, or smaller communities. And probably Janice got some in, in Arizona. So um, I think we do have to be 
aware of the socioeconomic impact. Uh, I think we have to get educated. I think one of the things we both talked about at the, the beginning of our conversation was even you know, algorithmic biases that we may not even be conscious of. Um, um, and I do think it, Congress has to kind of sort, sort that through how we get ahead of how do we get ahead of that? I, I don't know. One of the things I've been working on a lot in the last kind of post COVID era is, is racial wealth gap issues and access to capital, um, which again, doesn't solve every systemic racism problem, but if we can have fair access to capital, one of the things that's come out of COVID is we are seeing, you know, entrepreneurship activities in, in people of color in this country at an unprecedented level, you know, a progressive government that's actually, I would argue, kind of, you know, that wants the best American capitalism possible ought to be encouraging that. And again, access to capital, but that's, I'm, I'm slightly not answering your question, Daniel, because I think you, it's, a, it's a smart one, but I don't know the answer. Luckily, Secretary Napolitano has got a, a great, um, concise answer to that one that's going to lay out how we figure that all out on a social equity basis. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, it, it is a big question, and, and uh, the, the subtext of the question is, 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 is this a concern that Congress ought to take into account uh, as we move forward with AI or other emergent or disruptive technologies? Um, and um, I think uh, Congress ought to be aware uh, of what some of those consequences could be. Um, uh, I think Congress should, uh, uh, once they have awareness, look for ways to mitigate that um, and uh, uh, identify areas of the country that are particularly impacted positively or negatively. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, there's a, a fundamental decision to be made, which is, is this uh, uh, something that Congress needs to involve itself in, or uh, should we just allow nature to take its course? And I would just, let me just add one other thing to that is, you know, think how much fairer our economy might be right now. If we'd said in the late 90s, um, to, and I would say this a little radical, not only to our telecom providers, but some of the, uh, our platform companies who, have you know probably been the greatest accumulation of wealth maybe in in American history in a shorter period of time? You know, if there had been a prerequisite not dissimilar to what happened with um, electricity or water uh, in the 1930s, that there needed to be complete broadband build up, mm -hmm. you know, at at e equal levels of speed at an accessible price. Um, maybe that promise of connectivity and the ability to kind of build it anywhere could have been realized in a much greater basis. So we ought to learn from that. Right. Well, and, and on that, we have now the new infrastructure bill, which puts some serious dollars into that effort, which I, I think is one of the best parts of the bill. Amen. So let me give you one last question. We, we've talked um, you know, a great deal today about the role that sort of government has to play in forfending uh, against the risks, the perils that result uh, from, from emergent technologies. A turn of phrase uh, which, which has been deployed repeatedly is a sort of industrial policy, which I think is a really powerful way to signal uh, the necessity of, of some uh, sort of elevated level of government action to promote security in the face of disruptive technological change. But sort of the question that troubles me as I think about uh, sort of the, the regulatory uh, future is whether uh, we can move forward in a way uh, that engages uh, sort of US uh, international uh, you know, partners and allies and does not um, sort of accept uh, the, 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 the necessity of sort of treating all uh, sort of foreign competition equally with the effect that securing our society against the disruptive effects of novel uh, technologies results uh, in our country becoming sort of more insular, uh, more, more detached uh, from the world than it has been in the past. So, so is, is there a way uh, to, to reconcile uh, the need for a more active government role with uh, the international commitments that have defined U.S. foreign policy uh, since since the 1940s. Well, I'll take. I'm going to let you have the last word, Janice. So I'll take a first crack at that one. I, I mean, I I do think um, 
America did that in a way post-World War II, and maybe we will never have that disparity of wealth we had at that point. And we did it, even though we helped rebuild Europe and rebuild Japan, it didn't come at the cost. You know, American industry flourished uh, with that as well. Um, I think we're going to have to be a little more willing to, you know, share the, the benefits, you know, the, the CHIPS bill, which is important to help us domestically in, in you know, semiconductors, you know, should not be viewed as anti-South Korean or anti-Japanese or anti-the Dutch or uh, anti-even Taiwan for that matter. Um, you know, so how we do this in a way that shares some of the upsides is going to be, that's going to be hard. And, 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 and we also have to guard, I, I am not, you know, I'm, I use industrial policy lightly because uh, it, it's history of picking the wrong horse um, has been pretty broad, but I do think, you know, in a world where other nation states are making the kind of investments that we used to make and we have now, I mean, the Soviet Union was never an economic competitor. It was a military and, and ideological competitor. But when we have uh, the CCP in China with an economy, you know, soon to be greater, equal to or greater than ours, and they are making those kind of investments, I think we have to, in conjunction with them, uh, with that alliance of the willing, but also that means sharing some of the upside and not all of it has to be located in America. At the end of the day, I think our system in terms of its distribution of capital and if it's still willing to attract the best talent, uh, you know, we're still going to benefit, net net benefit, um, but it can't be uh, we win, your, Europe loses, or our friends in Asia lose. It can't be this binary choice. So I'll, I'll just follow up uh, on that. Uh, and um, I'm going to use vac COVID vaccines as, a, as an example. Um, to the extent that we can support vaccine distribution around the world, uh, the United States will benefit. Um, it will help the United States be protected from the next pandemic. Um, and. Um, I think as, as Senator and I were talking about earlier, um, developing a coalition of the willing on, on new emerging technologies like AI uh, will, will mean that we necessarily have to share more, but in the end, I think the calculus will be that we will benefit more. And, and uh, that's uh, the way I think the country should go. Um, Senator, we are at the end of our time. You have been more than generous with your time this morning. It's been a wonderful conversation. We appreciate what you do in Washington uh, and the contributions you're making. And we, uh, on behalf of UC Berkeley, on behalf of the Center for Security and Politics and the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity uh, at UC Berkeley, I just want to extend uh, my thanks to you and to Professor Sargent. It's been a wonderful program. Thank you. Professor Sargent, thank you. And Secretary Napolitano, it's, it's always been great. And your center at Berkeley is one of these entities that I've benefited from uh, interacting with and, and need to do more of. So thank you for the opportunity as well. You bet. All right. Have a good day, everybody.